Welcome to Picking Bones. Today we're going to talk about Freemasonry, and we're going to do it in the context of some recent comments by Jimmy Aiken, a Catholic apologist, on Matt Frad's Pints with Aquinas. Now let's jump right into it. Uh, Jimmy is asked uh, at the end of this like six and a half hour podcast about Freemasonry and whether or not it has infiltrated the Catholic Church. So let's jump into what he has to say here. The uh, given that uh, Freemasonry has been condemned by the Catholic Church since shortly after it began, you know, beginning with papal condemnations in the early 1700s. Um, well, why would a Catholic want to become a Mason? And how would someone who is fundamentally committed to an anti-Catholic version of Masonry, how would they become an influential Catholic? There is not an anti-Catholic version of Masonry. Masonry is fundamentally opposed to the church. It always has been. The church has condemned it from the beginning. Jimmy's well aware of this. You know, like a cardinal or something, you know, um, knowing the penalties that would apply to them if they're ever exposed. What's what's the motivation? To take down the church, to seriously yeah, harm so do, the church. Do, do, well, Matt gives the the good answer to this very stupid question like why would masons want to infiltrate the church to destroy it they're sworn to fight the church in their oaths well okay so um there are people who have who have tried to infiltrate the church for various purposes, like in the communist world behind the Iron Curtain. And now he goes off topic and talks about the communists for a while, and then he's going to get into talking about Leo Taxil. Um, and he actually has his own whole podcast on Leo Taxil. It's an hour and a half. Uh, this is the video here. And at the start of this video, I think he starts to reveal his hand. So let's see what he he and his uh, podcasting partner have to say here. Now, before we begin, Dom, I understand you have had some experience with the Masons. Yes. Uh, my father, who passed away about a year ago, was a Mason for pretty much as long as I can remember, most of his adult life, I think. And I know he had become a grandmaster of his local lodge and held other positions of importance within the group. And I do remember at one point as a young child attending a Masonic ceremony at his lodge, probably when he became a master. And over the years, I, I knew that there was conflict between Freemasonry and the Catholic Church, and he and I talked about it. And without going to all the details, he always gave reasons why he saw no conflict for himself. And my dad was a devout Catholic to the end of his life, going to daily mass, praying every day and receiving the sacraments. So that's not uncommon. There are a lot of Catholics who see no conflict between Catholicism and Freemasonry and will be talking about the. So Jimmy never comes out and says like he's good with Masonry, uh, that that he thinks it, that this is OK. He never outright says that. But that seems to be his attitude, that the, the church is wrong and extreme in its condemnation of Masonry. Um, we're going to look at some comments at the end of the video uh, under some of his videos where he's responded to people in, in YouTube that further make me think this. But Jimmy is aware that the church condemns masonry and it has for a very long time. And yet he chooses to focus on the Taxil hoax. So who's Leo Taxil? Honestly, I've never dug into this issue. Like, listening to Jimmy's podcast on this is the most I've ever heard about this issue. And I've been studying masonry for decades. Now, the reason I've never dug into this issue is that it's irrelevant. It's, it's a, this issue is typically brought up by Masonic apologists who want to, who want to attack people who are going after Freemasonry. And they say, oh, you're just basing your condemnation of masonry off of these nonsensical hoaxes. And so 
I, there's so much information about masonry and the occult and other secret societies out there that there's no reason to use anything that's questionable because we have so much good material. So I don't want to use things that are considered hoaxes, whether they are or not, because I'm not trying because there's so much good information and I don't want anyone to just like immediately disregard what I have to say because I'm using something that they, they think is laughable. So the Taxil hoax, this guy was essentially a anti-Christian guy. He made a lot of joke pamphlets about Christianity and then he claimed to have converted to Christianity and then became like anti-Masonic and write about, wrote about how Masonry was actually satanic and that there was this other spinoff Mason group that was like purely satanic. And it's a bunch of nonsense and he duped a bunch of people. Okay. So this this is what Jimmy wants wants to focus on when talking about Freemasonry knowing that the church has historically condemned it. What he chooses to focus on is this hoax that makes uh, a lot a lot of Catholics look like idiots for buying into a clear hoax. And that's what he chose to focus on. And the reason he says that, you know, he goes, he basically tells the whole story as if it's not a hoax. And then at the end is like, oh, and then it's a hoax. Um, so if you want to like have fun story time, maybe you enjoy something like this. I, I study these things because I want to understand them. And if you look up Leo Taxel, you'll immediately see Taxel hoax. But um, so this is, this is not a topic that needs any focus. If we want to know if masonry is satanic, if it's a problem for the church, we want to look at good information. So what we're going to do to show that masonry is very clearly satanic, it is fundamentally opposed to the church, is we're going to look at this symbol, this Masonic symbol. And we're going to look at who is this woman and who is this man and why does this matter? So, this is from Morals and Dogma by Albert Pike, an important Freemasonry, in, an important Masonic figure. <laughs> uh, so he says, a lodge inaugurated under the auspices of Rousseau, the fanatic of Geneva, became the center of the revolutionary movement in France. So he's arguing that it was the secret societies, like Masonry in particular, guiding the French Revolution. It says the secret movers of the French Revolution had sworn to overturn overturn the throne and altar, meaning the church and the monarchy, upon the tombs of Jacques de Molay, who was the last Grand Master of the Knights Templar. When the king was executed, uh, half the work was done, and so they set out against the Pope next. Okay. Now. Knights Templar, <laughs> the, the Freemasons claim to be descendants of the Knights Templar. And I think this is accurate. I think that they really did spawn out of the remnants of the Knights Templar. Now, historically, what happened with the Knights Templar, they were a monastic order during the Crusades. Uh, but eventually, the church itself condemned the Knights Templar for being a satanic cult that spat on the cross, among other things. And they executed the leadership and disbanded the organization. That's what happened in history, all right? Later on, now, the Catholic Church says that they were wrong to do that and that uh, the Knights Templar were slandered and that they actually were good guys, all right? But I would argue that's BS, that the Knights Templar were actually an occult organization and that... Uh, they the church was right to condemn it and one of the the co-founders of the knights templar was bernard of clairvaux and um he was a weird mystic uh and uh <laughs> one thing in particular we're not going to dig into this guy too much it's just important this is one of the guys that started this order and you know he had this vision where uh the virgin mary uh, you know, was uh, nursing baby Christ and she took Christ off of her, off of her teat and she squeezed her breast and squirted across, 
uh, 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 quite a distance uh, into uh, uh, onto Bernard's face. Uh, all right, and there are multiple images of this. Here's another one. Um, if you think that this is Christian, I don't really know what to tell you. This is like this is clearly blasphemous and vile, vile to the core. This is terrible. Um, yeah, but you have things like this uh, within Catholicism, and Bernard of Clairvaux is one of these guys. And he helped start the Knights Templar, this creepy satanic cult. All right. <clears throat> now, let's jump into the Bible. And we're going to talk now about Tammuz. He said, this is from Ezekiel. He said also unto me, turn thee yet again, and thou shalt see gr greater abominations that they do. Then he brought me to the door of the gate of the Lord's house, which was towards the north, and behold, there sat women weeping for Tammuz. So he mentions this ancient pagan practice of weeping for Tammuz. Now, the early uh, Christian origin, he wrote about this mourning for Tammuz. He says, it is said that one called Adonis among the Greeks is named Tammuz among the Hebrews and the Syrians. So Tammuz and Adonis are the same figure, okay? And both Christians and historians and Masons themselves all agree on this, all right? This is uh, another Masonic text. Which one is this? Uh, I think this is from The Secret Teachings of All Ages. Yep, from Manly P. Hall. Uh, and he mentions the myth of Tammuz and Ishtar is one of the early examples, or at least examples of the dying god allegory. The dying god is a big topic in of itself uh, that we're not going to dig too much in here, but it's important to note that Freemasonry links these figures. That uh, says down below. Here again is a repetition of the story of Osiris, Bacchus, Adonis, Balder, and Hiram Abiff. So all of Masonry, Masonic symbolism is is largely based around this figure of Hiram Abiff and the temp the building of the Temple of Solomon. So Masons equate these gods including tammuz to hiram abiff themselves okay uh this is from uh, mackey's encyclopedia of freemasonry and uh just we're gonna look at just this last sentence here the inquiring freemason will thus readily see the analogy and the symbolism that exists between adonis in the mysteries of Gabeltes at, at Byblos and Hiram the Builder in his own institution. Now here's another uh, entry from Mackey's Encyclopedia on the widow's son. Be because weeping for Tammuz was about crying over the death of the widow's son. Okay, it's it's about crying over the death of Tammuz, who they link to Hiram of Biff. All right. So it says in ancient craft masonry, the title applied to Hiram, the architect of the temple, because he is said in the first book of Kings to have been a widow's son of the tribe of Nephalti, of Nephalti. the Adon Hiramite Freemasons. So that is Adonis. Hiram Abiff, Adon Hiramite Freemasons, have a tradition which Chaperon gives in the following words, the Freemasons call themselves the widow's sons because after the death of our respectable master, the Freemasons took care of his mother's blah, blah, blah. Widow's sons is another name for Freemasons. They directly link themselves to what is condemned in the Bible here. And like this passage is Ezekiel being shown uh, abominable practices within the church by people who are not actually worshiping God. They're actually worshiping pagan gods. And we see this with the Israelites all throughout their history where they're often, you know, turning away from the Lord and w worshiping pagan gods and getting into horrific practices so st 
Stephen, the martyr Stephen, or the proto-martyr, he, uh, he spoke about how Israel continually did this as well. Um, it's interesting when he, when Stephen's talking, it's to a group called the synagogue of the freedmen, just the, the name of the group. Interesting. Uh, but it says, then they secretly induced men to say, we have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and God. And they stirred up the people and the elders and the scribes, and they came upon him, seized him and brought him to the council. Stephen was out there sharing the gospel, proclaiming it and doing a, a brilliant job of sharing it with people and leading others to Christ. And so the authorities, the Jewish authorities, did not like that, and they pulled him in and they slandered him to try to take him down. And then Stephen uh, gives a beautiful explanation of all of Jewish history and, and showing how it all leads to Christ. Uh, but in the midst of his uh, explanation of all of this, he mentions uh, the Jews turning away from, Christ, uh, from, from, from God. He says, you also took up the tabernacle of Moloch and the star of your god, Remphan, images which you made to worship. And he's quoting the Old Testament here. And so Moloch, uh, most known as a god who people sacrificed babies to. So the Jews were sacrificing their babies to Moloch at a time. And it also says, the star of your god, Remphan. Now, who's Remphan? Remphan, uh, scholars agree, is, uh, is associated with the planet Saturn or the god Saturn. Now, let's get back to this image because we know who these figures are now. All right. This is the Weeping Widow. This is Isis or or other figures they would all kind of equate to one another but this is the weeping widow weeping over the death of Hiram Abiff or or the death of Osiris or of Tammuz okay and this one here this is the god of time the, with the big scythe and this is and here you have the hourglass this is Saturn so it's it's uh, it's the weep it's Isis and Saturn essentially um, so this is from Morals and Dogma, again, from Albert Pike, speaking of this symbol. And he says, blue, blue masonry, blue masonry is the first three degrees of Freemasonry, which every Mason must go through in order to then advance into the, the other groups within Masonry. And then they could join like things like the Scottish Rite, um, and or the York Rite or, or other Masonic groups. Uh, but every Mason has to first go through those three ranks. So blue Masonry, ignorant of its import, still retains among its, its emblems one of a woman weeping over a broken column, holding in her hand a branch of acacia, myrtle, or tamarisk, while time, we are told, stands behind her, combing out the ringlets of her hair. We need not repeat the vapid and trivial explanation there given of the representation of Isis weeping at Byblos over the column torn from the palace of the king that contained the body of Osiris, while Horus, the god of time, pours ambrosia on her hair. Nothing of this recital is historical, but the whole was an allegory or sacred fable containing meaning which is only known to those who are initiated into the mysteries. All the incidents were astronomical, meaning with a meaning still deeper lying behind that explanation, and so hidden by a double veil. Something important to understand about Masonic symbolism is that there are always multiple layers behind every symbol. And low-level Masons are intentionally misled. There are many places where 
Pike and others speak about that specifically, that low level missions are intentionally misled uh, because they don't deserve to know the truth. Like uh, Albert Pike in particular seems to really speak of disdain towards the lower Masons who don't really know what they're in because Masonry is the king of cults. And just like things like Scientology today, where you have to really work your way through the ranks and be involved in the organization for a long time or study it out thoroughly to actually know what they teach, to actually know what it's all about. And so they intentionally mislead people in secret societies at the lower levels. They, these lower level Masons are pawns to the higher level Masons. And the true meaning of this symbol, like this, this is women weeping for Tammuz and, uh, and, and Saturn comforting her. All right. You know, when we look at these these symbols and these figures in the Bible, they're they're very clearly condemned. But the Masons, they make them their top symbols because Masonry is deeply satanic. Here's another entry from Mackley, Mackey's Encyclopedia uh, from the Scythe. In classic mythology, the scythe was one of the attributes of Saturn, the god of time, because that deity is said to have taught men the use of... Uh, of the implement in agriculture, but Saturn was also the god of time. Blah blah blah. Freemasonry has adopted this symbolism in the third degree. The seath is described as an emblem of time. So yeah, Albert Pike called it called it uh, Horus, but I think Saturn is a better explanation, and other other Masonic sources would point to that being Saturn. Uh, this old man with the with the beard and the scythe that's uh, typically a description of saturn so yeah you have this image is common in freemasonry there's all sorts of versions of it, it this is an important masonic symbol look at all these all right and it's it's deeply satanic <laughs> and you know all of masonry is is is, is counter to the bible it's it's satanic and it's Gnostic. It's specifically Gnostic. So this comes from Manly P. Hall's lectures on ancient philosophy. Uh, and it says here, if it wasn't clear enough to you yeah, that masonry is satanic, listen to this. At last, the spirit of rebellion entered creation in the form of Lucifer, who in the guise of a serpent tempted man to revolt against the mandates of Jehovah, the Demiurge. The Demiurge is a Gnostic idea. They, they demonize the God of the Old Testament and separate him from the God of the New Testament. Okay, This is an ancient Gnostic idea. And it is fundamentally opposed to Christianity. The Gnostics were like the the earliest enemies of the church. And, you know, so much of, of the, the Antichrist doesn't just mean against Christ. It means replacement for Christ. So much of what the enemy does in its work in satan meaning uh so much of how he works is is about creating these false versions of christianity it's about twisting christianity look at all of these spin-off cults including even islam it's all about attacking the deity of christ it's about replacing the christian religion with some twisted version of it it's about twisting the truth of what christ and the apostles taught and and turning it into something else so let me, let me just read this again at last the spirit of rebellion entered creation in the form of lucifer who in the guise of a serpent tempted man to revolt against the mandates of jehovah who he calls the demiurge in greece this character was known as prometheus who brought from the gods the impregnating flame that would release the life latent in this multitude of germ-like potentialities. In Christianity, Christ is the divine fire which, striking the latent germs of immortality, liberates them from their ages of impotency. 
in occultism, they equate Lucifer and Prometheus. The idea of stealing the fire from the gods to give to mankind because the gods were holding mankind back. They say this is a good thing. And they view the serpent in the garden telling mankind that ye shall be as gods. They view that as the ultimate truth. Occultism is all about apotheosis. It's about becoming a god. It's about acceptance of the satanic lie in the garden. And they view Lucifer as a heroic figure standing against a tyrannical deity trying to liberate humanity to, by letting us know this information that we can become gods as well. This is deeply evil. It is fundamentally opposed to anything Christian. This is unacceptable. Masonry is condemned by the church and ha has always been condemned by the church for very good reason. And so for a Catholic apologist to defend Masonry on any level is pretty unacceptable. Um, and I want to end this video just by looking at some of the, the comments on some of these things. So this is, this is the clip from this initial podcast where it's just like the section on Freemason we clipped out. And I just want to look at some of the comments because there's some great comments on, <laughs> on these videos. Uh, this one says, my father was a Mason in France. He joined after a friend had invited him and he said he looked he was looking into his father's masonry and he saw all this occult vile things uh tarot cards egyptian mythology lots of mentions of the temple of solomon for the master mason level they basically reenact the murder scene it's hard to understand everything because they use lots of code words and s signs throughout their rituals they repeat the f phrase liberté égalité fraternité as they did in the French Revolution, and that has become the motto of France itself. They also always start their ritual by opening the Bible to the prologue of St. John's Gospel. I get so upset when I hear Catholics saying Freemasonry is just a club for upper middle class boomers. No, it's not. It's a Gnostic sect that promises its members they'll acquire secret knowledge unknown to the rest of mankind. They do a kind of syncretism between Kabbalah, Jewish mysticism, Egyptian mythology, and Christianity. It teaches them man is the measure of all things, while at the same time referring to the great architect of the universe, which is a kind of faceless god. It's just disturbing. Please pray for my dad. He is a fallen away Catholic. A lot of people didn't like what Jimmy uh, <laughs> said, and uh, some of these comments, commenters like clearly have better knowledge of masonry than Jimmy himself. Here's another one. I'm a former Freemason. I left Freemasonry after coming to the faith. I can say with 100% certainty Freemasonry and its appendant organizations are not what they seem on the surface. Sadly, because we do not wrestle solely against flesh and blood, many are blind to the true natures of the rituals of the fraternity. I continue to pray for all members of the craft that they would find the one true light of Jesus Christ. Indeed, we should pray for the Freemasons. And, and members of all of these occult societies that they would recognize that what they are a part of is evil and they should turn to the true God, Jesus Christ. Here's a based comment. The church condemns it. That's all I need to know. Yeah. Why, why is Jimmy going so out of the way to, uh, to, <laughs> to, to talk about how, we need to be careful when when studying masonry like that that seems like his only concern with this like hour and a half podcast that he did uh talking about leo taxel is the you know the moral of the story essentially for, from his standpoint is that we need to be careful when studying freemasonry and not throw out blind condemnations of of masonry or other groups um yeah we do need to be careful uh when we study topics like greatly controversial topics like this sure you should be careful but uh i think it's incredibly uh dangerous and uh 
you're being a poor teacher to talk about masonry for so long and not focus more on the fact that the church has condemned it for good reason. You want to talk about masonry for an hour and a half and uh, you're not going to make that your focus. I, I don't know what you're doing, dude. Uh, I'll go with that. We'll go with a couple more comments here uh, before we wrap it up. I call bullshit. Don't be so gullible. I was not raised Catholic. My father was a Mason, but he never really talked about it beyond the fact that he had to go to meetings from time to time. I recall asking him more detailed questions out of curiosity because he would never really answer. When I was in my early 20s, I became a cop like my dad, and he was thinking about joining Masonry. His dad t pulled him aside and said, stay as far away, away from the Masons as you could possibly get and never forget it. He had this look of fear on his face that I had never seen before. He would not speak beyond that. And I've heard this from multiple people where their fathers or people that they knew were Masons that got out of it, but then they wouldn't really talk about it. Because the fact is, Masons are sworn to secrecy. And I've talked to Masons that still want to maintain that secrecy, even after stepping away from it, recognizing how evil it is. And that's an interesting topic. Should Are they still bound to those oaths of secrecy? Or... Should they expose what they know? Uh, I would argue the latter, but many ex-Masons feel this way. Um, when his father passed away, he was given a jewelry box. He examined his Masonic ring, which he always wore, and it looked similar to a class ring with a green stone. I noticed the glint under the stone, so I grabbed a magnifying glass and a flashlight for closer inspection, and I signed the light down so I could see the numbers 33 underneath. I was stunned. My dad was a 33rd degree masonry, a mason. I've heard the satanic stories too, and I never put much credence into it. But when I think back to the obvious fear my dad had on his face when he demanded that I never get involved with the masons, I came to believe it. I only wonder what he had to do to obtain that degree, and I worry, worry where his soul is now. God have mercy on him. Masonry is horrific, and uh, it's it's obvious. There is so much information out there that, that shows how evil masonry is. If we want to talk about masonry, that's what we should be focused on, not nonsense hoaxes. Last comment we'll look at here is another short video where Jimmy was asked about masonry. And... Uh, this comment says, Hi guys, I love your posts. However, I noted something in this video that bothered me a little. You both claim that there is no evidence that there are Masons in the hierarchy of the church. Now, this of course depends on your definition of evidence. Nevertheless, there is a list of cardinals who admit to be Masons, and it was published in an Italian paper by Father Putti in 1977. In addition, the Masons will leave themselves names of high-ranking Catholic churchmen and priests to embarrass the church. So the evidence is there. Historical evidence indicates that the rubrics of the Mass and the liturgical celebrations have been slowly changing from between 1948 through 1969 when the Novus Ordo Mass became mandatory in all churches. Introduced by Archbishop Bugnini, by the way, just wondering if you read the book by Father Anthony titled Work of Human Hands, a Theological Critique of the Mass of Paul VI. Anyways, some evidence seems to be there, if anyone cares to look, as Archbishop Lefbreviv, I don't know how to say that, sorry, once said when asked if high ranking, if a high-ranking clergy was a Mason, he doesn't need to be. He thinks like one. In other words, they can do just as much damage to the church as one who is a Mason with their secular enlightenment ideals. And that's the thing. The Masons accomplished so much of what they set out to do during the revolutionary era. They overthrew our Christian monarchs. They weakened the church. They fractured it. The Masons do all they can to attack Christianity. And and now much of that is done just through ideas, you know, the enlightenment. And, and so much of modern thought comes out of the Masonic lodges, liberté, égalité, fraternité. 
the, the motto of France and the motto of the Grand Lodge. This, these are the people who founded the modern world, who formed the modern world. And if you want to understand more about that, uh, make sure to like this video and subscribe. And uh, that's because that's what we do here. We talk about Freemasonry and the things that actually matter about Masonry. And Jimmy, if you somehow see this, I hope that uh, the next time you decide to talk about Freemasonry and the church, you'll talk about how right the church is to condemn it because it's obviously satanic and all Christians of any kind should be standing against them. Thank you for watching. Have a great day. God bless.